Good Monday morning. Good Monday morning of the fifth week of Easter. This is the last full week, I believe, before we get to, to Pentecost, okay? I, watch me just blow that, but whatever. It's interesting because the Acts of the Apostles shows the growth of the church, and it shows a very graphic form as they were trying to figure out how to get how to incorporate the Gentiles into the church. I'm not saying that right, but you'll see in the end they're going to have a conflict between Jewish Christians who want to practice the Mosaic Law and its final rejection. Okay, you see that that we are not bound by the Mosaic Law. It's St. Paul. Okay, that's the genius of St. Paul. Okay, so you're going to see it evolve as the week goes on. I didn't say any of that right today, but you get, what I get at, uh, that was so interesting is you. If I use an expression, the church figures out who and what she is as she lives it. And the apostles are learning it as they live it and as they're persecuted. This early document, I believe the Acts of the Apostles is one of the earliest of the documents, if not the earliest. It's written by St. Lu Luke, as the tradition says, who is the disciple of St. Paul. So you're hearing the theology of Paul evolve. That's what I think. And I think of the church that way. When I want to understand the church and her doctrines and her teaching, that I see it as evolving through the experience of the church as the church reflects upon herself. And here was the apostles of reflecting on themselves and on the life of Christ as they were living it. So it's not a separate, it's not like telling a story out there who in this Jesus is. They're seeing this who and what is Jesus in the life of the church itself. And I think they began to see two things that are very important, and this is St. Paul. Okay, the first thing is that the church is the body of Christ in the world, and they, the Good Friday never comes to an end, because that's the second point. And namely, that we, to quote St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, we fill up those things wanting in the suffering of Christ. The act of redemption occurs not once and for all, as it were, of a singular act on Good Friday. But Good Friday never comes to an end, because the suffering of the church See, in John's gospel, what you see is the blood and the water flow from his side. It's not only the, the water of baptism, but it's the blood of martyrdom. We share in the suffering of Christ. And you see it in the story of the apostles. They're getting their brains knocked out, <laughs> to use my expression. And they're, they, it's, in just this week here alone, Paul gets stoned twice, okay? They think he's dead. He's not dead. And he, and he keeps on moving. And some, they use common sense. Sometimes we're getting out of this neighborhood. This isn't too good around here. <laughs> they, they move because they, the room, they're going to get creamed. Okay, so they're not saying, all right, martyr me. Come on, have fun. They're not doing that. They're living the life. They're preaching the gospel in the circumstances of their life. And they're doing the things that are also morally prudent. You see? see? And in some senses, you'll see it with St. Peter, they'll also... Uh, live out the, Paul and Barnabas, they also live the Christ life by raising a guy from his, uh, his lifelong uh, infirmity. He was a cripple all his life. So to me, the guy, you'll see it when I read the text here eventually, that I take the, to be paralyzed all your life is to be paralyzed in ignorance. And as they call him into the faith, the guy was willing to believe. He wanted to believe. As they tell him to rise, they are actually preaching the gospel to him. And they have freed him from the impediment of ignorance and blindness. I'm sure he got back on his feet. It's a lot bigger than that. It's a lot bigger than that. The, the miracles are always both physical and, in a sense, moral, spirit, spiritually moral as well. So it's not, these guys are not miracle workers. They're not playing tricks like at a carnival. What they're doing is they're proclaiming the gospel to the world, and the world is partially the recipient and partially not. They're also taking the heat, and they take plenty of heat. They're all martyred, all but you know, all but St. John got martyred, you see? They share in the blood of Christ. That is the genius of it all. But here's the, in the text, Paul really, uh, it's, it's right here, I'll show it to you, he said, at Lystra, there was a crippled man, lame from birth. See, I take that to mean uh, locked in blindness, you see, ignorance, who had never walked. He was never free. Free of what? Never free of ignorance, you see, of final ignorance, you see. He listened to Paul speaking, who looked intently at him and saw that he had the, he had the faith to be healed. And he called out in a loud voice, Stand straight up, stand up straight on your feet. Get up, you see. He jumped up and began to walk about. Then, of course, what happens, it's misinterpreted. So the crowds thought, holy moly, 
the gods have come down in human form. Somebody called Barnabas Zeus, and Paul was Hermes because he was the speaker. And the priests of Zeus came out. They wanted to burn incense around him, kill a few cows, whatever, whatever. They said, God, that's not me. Not a, we're not divine. We're just spokespeople for her. So said, proclaim, we're here to proclaim the good news. We're not. We're just human beings. We, we proclaim the good news to you, good news, that you should turn from these false idols to the living God who made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them. See? In the past generations, he allowed all Gentiles to go their own way. Yet in bestowing his goodness, he didn't leave him alone. He did not leave himself without witness. For he gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons and filled you with nourishment and gladness for your hearts. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. They saw the miracle. I wonder if they saw the wisdom too. They had to recognize that the wisdom and the preaching of the gospel was within, not from without. The Holy Spirit lies within the church, not outside of it. It's in the church. That's Pentecost, you see. That's the truth. And you see in John's gospel where you see the centrality of the Eucharist, okay, the body and blood of Christ. See, to really understand the church, I really believe this, you have to see the church as the body of Christ, not just in the Eucharist, which is, of course, preeminently so. But there's no separation between the Eucharist and the people of God, the baptized, as it were, the Christian community. You can't distinguish. You can distinguish it in words. You can distinguish it in emphasis, but not in reality. There is no Eucharist without the church, and the church is the people of God, but there are no people of God without the Eucharist either. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, you see? That's St. John. That's the text, 14th chapter, right? Yeah. I think that's so important to understand in the life of the faith. We are not just into liturgy and cult. We are into the life of the church. And we evolve with the church, not only through our faith, but our actions. As the body of Christ in the world, we free the world from the cri the crippled state of ignorance. We are here to make a difference. The apostles made a difference. Christ made a difference. The apostles made a difference. We must make a difference. And we do it, we do it by the wisdom that God has given us through the gospel and the preaching of the church and by the actions we take to heal the wounds of the world. And that runs the whole entire gamut. <laughs> From healthcare to education, you name it. I'm being really being trivial when I say that. It's to take us out of the darkness and the crippled state of ignorance into the freedom of the children of God. That's what the church does. That's what we have to do. And we do it in our own ways, our own vocational ways. Those of you who are parents, you are doing that when the way you raise your children, the way you live your vows to each other, your spousal vows. I do it through the priesthood and religious life, through it as an educator, whatever. We each are called uniquely to be apostles to the world, and the world is not generic, it's our own specific homes. It's the venues in which we function and live. I don't know if I said that right or not. I believe that. There is no Christ without the church, no church without Christ. There's no church without the Eucharist, but no Eucharist without the church. And we are the church. We come to the table of the Lord for the body and blood of Christ, and we live the body and blood of Christ, how we live and die, making a difference in our homes, in our world, whatever we are called, by God, in Christ, to serve.